Good morning. Welcome to another State of Reform. This is our 2021 Northern California State of Reform Health Policy Conference. And my name is DJ Wilson, one of the folks bringing you this year's event. Of course, we're virtual again. Uh, last year when we hosted this, of course, we were going to host it in the spring, which is when we typically do it. And the whole, whole world stopped in the spring uh, last year, and we moved this to August. And uh, at least in 2020, we moved it to August. And so it's been a few months since I have seen many of you metaphorically and of course been be seen. It's always nice. I'm glad uh, I still am able to be seen. I'm glad you are all still able to be with us. Uh, we're super excited and continue to uh, value and appreciate uh, the honor that you give us to host this conference, to host this conversation, and to do the reporting that we provide on California healthcare and health policy. Uh, it's the wind that you put in our sails that uh, allows us to do this. And of course, as many of you know, because many of you have been with us at State of Reform in years past, uh, everything we do throughout the year, uh, all 365 days, is because of the support that we generate at our conference. So we don't, uh, uh, we don't have an impression-based model for our news. We don't try to get a bunch of clicks and make scary headlines to get people to click and come back over and over again. It's, uh, it's because you guys show up, uh, show up for us at a conference like this one. And so I just want to say thank you from all of us here and, uh, and jump right into it. Uh, this is a, always a big event and very exciting for us. And it's great to hear so many different kinds of thought leaders that we get to sort of sit in on throughout the day. And, we host this and you see this in the form of our agenda and our speakers uh, as an effort really to bridge the gap here between the world of healthcare and the world of health policy. We think that those two cultures, one a culture of specialization that's a mile uh, deep and an inch wide, that of healthcare, and the culture of generalization in many cases where you need to be a, a mile wide and an inch deep in, in politics, those two cultures are somewhat like oil and water. Uh, they don't want to hang out with each other sometimes if they uh, can help it. And so we try to create a space uh, in person, of course, but also virtually here where we can get people in the room together, where we can provide content that elevates some of the most interesting stuff that's happening. Uh, we're now generating, we're on track to generate uh, almost 3,000, or actually over 3,000 stories that we'll independently publish here at State of Reform just on state level healthcare and health policy, uh, it's amazing. And it's because uh, folks like you all help, like I say, put wind in our sails to make it happen. And we think that uh, this is important. Uh, and 15 years ago, some of you will remember the, the documentary Super Size Me. Uh, and one of the things that came out of that moment is this sort of slow food movement. And I think we know that slow food is better than fast food in terms of building community. You can sit around the table together and have conversation. Uh, and if you have too much fast food, in fact, you will make your body sick. I mention that because it's the metaphor we use for our content here at State of Reform. We think that slow news is better to build community than is fast news. And if you have too much fast news, you will make the body politic sick as well. And so we are trying to do something different here. Uh, and part of it is rooted in my uh, experience as a uh, a young, naive 15-year-old uh, uh, boy in 1990 watching both at the same time uh, the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein and what becomes Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And of course, at the same time watching uh, uh, this movie, which n none of you should remember, but it's uh, this movie about Memphis Bell and or this movie called Memphis Bell about a bunch of flyboys who were flying their 25th mission over the German and European theater back in uh, 1944. They were the first uh, guys to, uh, to um, make, or one of the first uh, uh, crews to make a full 25 flights over that theater. And uh, as they started off on their 25th flight, they read a poem by the, the great Irish, uh, young Irish uh, poet, uh, Yeats, who they, re who they read as a, as a prayer, actually, but it was a poem that stuck with me, thinking about our politics back in, 1990, where Yeats uh, has this poem called The Second Coming. It's a biblical reference, of course, but it was about World War I. And in that, he says the, that things fall apart, that the center cannot hold, that mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, and that the blood dim tide is loosed, and everywhere ceremony of innocence is drowned, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And those words, of course, stuck with me, uh, trying to figure out my, my sort of way in politics back then. And, 
And they stood out for me back in 2009 when the Affordable Care Act conversation was kicking off. And of course, it was hard sometimes to know what was truth. We're sort of in this post-truth world, actually, which is really something, saying something. Uh, you'll recall this, this post about death panels or referencing what would become known as death panels by former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin only had 24 shares on, on Facebook, but the notion of death panels changes the entire construct of our healthcare politics really for a decade. That led to the, uh, the uh, 2010 Tea Party election, which was very much a reaction to the healthcare law. Uh, and of course, healthcare has been a dominant topic in our politics ever since. Uh, it was a catalyzing and mobilizing issue in a number of midterm elections, including the 2016 uh, presidential election, which leads to, of course, the U.S. House of Representatives passing a, a repeal bill that, but for one vote in the United States Senate, would have, uh, would have overturned all of the Affordable Care Act. So it has impacted our, uh, our politics and our community in a lot of different ways. Of course, that pendulum swings back, and in 2018, Democrats win more votes than at any uh, point in history. Uh, a greater, not just a vote count for midterm congressional candidates, but a greater differential as a percentage. They had 8 million more votes that year. So as the pendulum swung towards Democrats in 2018, we see again healthcare continue to dominate our politics. It happened in 2016, 2017, 2018. Uh, and opinion, if you were a Democratic voter, you cared about, uh, you cared about our healthcare policy conversation. And that fed into, of course, not just the, uh, the midterm elections, but it feeds into then the presidential primary, where even folks like uh, now Vice President Kamala Harris was making relatively revolutionary statements. Um, and, and, and of course that was part of the context where uh, folks on the left were calling for an end to healthcare as we know it and a total uh, change uh, in our system. I'm not arguing that one is better or worse. I have no dog in this political fight necessarily, but it does strike me uh, that we are swinging on this pendulum and that if we, uh, if we step back and we watch our politics and how they impact our society and impact particularly healthcare, uh, one thing I, I think I know is that, uh, having watched uh, politics for a few decades, that uh, things always move more slowly than they should in politics, right up until the point at which they move more quickly than they should. And it's that point when they move quickly that sometimes things get broken. And so our, our politics, whether left or right, have tended towards the extreme. They have tended towards uh, passionate uh, intensity, and that has not always been fabulous for uh, either our politics or our society. Turns out you can quantify some of this. And again, this is just trying to put numbers to what we're watching on left, right, and middle. There's this new field of study called cleodynamics. It's really where you can allocate quantitative measures to things that we have heretofore thought were more qualitative. Uh, Peter Turchin is this guy who's written a couple of books on it. If you're looking to geek out as an insomniac and, and put yourself to sleep late at night, you can uh, uh, pick up one of his books. Uh, and he, he has found and pulled in all of these different data sets from across history, really. And in the modern American Republic, he points towards things like uh, the decline in the trust of government, which we know, which we intuit, which we have seen, uh, and which we can quantify. He points towards things like uh, increase in income inequality in the United States, and of course, Many of you fit into the top 10% uh, uh, of uh, income here in the United States, as you can see it on the right there. Uh, the top 10% of folks in the United States, really that is the elite. We don't think of ourselves as the elite very often, uh, but the top 10%, that's, you know, that's, that's sort of the definition of, of the elite. Moreover, our politics aren't always working. We see that self-evidently sometimes in the U.S. Senate where the uh, number of filibuster uh, threats has essentially shut down that chamber where now a 60% vote is required on almost all policy matters that come before the United States Senate, up to 70% 70, 70 here a few years ago. Not only is it changing our politics, of course, this period in which we find ourselves is changing our, our, our literature and our vocabulary. We are actually... Uh, 
using words like cooperation half as often as we do in our literature as we were 70 years ago. We're using words like greed as often as we ever have. Turns out Google has cataloged and indexed all of this stuff and you can go and count, as Peter Turchin has done, uh, the number of times we use certain words. So when you add all of this stuff up, back uh, in 2010, Peter Turchin said, or 2012 when he uh, wrote this last book, he charted this, this up and put this, this goodwill index and this political stress index together. And he said that we are, in 2012, likely to have an insurrectionary, an insurrectionary, insurrectionary moment uh, in, uh, by 2020, a 25% chance of an insurrectionary moment in 2020. We have not been this fragile as an American democratic republic uh, as we have been since 1861 at the onset of the Civil War. He was just using his math, essentially his numbers, to chart this path. And he has said that in looking at the United States of America and looking at other societies that have, have been challenged and which have fallen or which have, uh, have fallen into disrepair, that there are three key principles, three key things that have to happen uh, really for an American democratic republic like ours to falter. He says, the first thing that has to happen is there has to be a rise of income inequality. When that happens, it, it, it creates the, uh, the foundational moment for uh, a society to fall apart. We have that in America, of course. We also need to have uh, significant erosion in our trust of, in government, which of course we see uh, a, a, in a number of instances. But the third piece is the one that I think is the most powerful and the most compelling, which is that the ability of elites to solve problems has to erode or disappear. That's super important. That's super important. Because when we are here together today, you choose to be here, you choose to come to this, you choose to, to engage as a speaker or as an attendee, and, and you're leaning into this moment, and it's not your job, it's not my job, I can't, I can't do much about the rising income inequality in America. You can't do much about the rising income inequality in America. Uh, I can't do much about trying to fix the trust in the U.S. Senate or the change of filibuster, and you can't uh, you know, fix trust in government necessarily. But what we can do together is to work together as elites. It's not a term that we choose to place on ourselves, but we are the people that can solve the problems when it comes to healthcare. We are the people who can put forward solutions, try innovations, see what works better, test, innovate, innovate and iterate. Uh, and so we can feel that this time in America is precarious. We know that, we see it on television. Our job is to just do our job. Our job is to just do what we can to fix healthcare. And by doing our job, we will contribute to the overall good of our uh, democratic republic. So that's why we're here. We try to be, build together and bring together these great conversations and opportunities for networking and, uh, and, and, and rely on tools from the digital era for conversations. We see those in simple things like our digital agenda where you can favorite things and download those to your calendar so that you can come back whenever you want and watch any of these sessions on demand. We expect you to come and go throughout the day. You should. Go answer emails, go to other calls, uh, Zoom meetings. But come back, uh, come back later today, come back in the days after. So man, you can manage this on your calendar. You can put together essentially a business card. This business card, your profile with your picture and your LinkedIn and your, your email, uh, all of those things are like your old plastic name badge that you would wear uh, around the conference. And this is how you make eye contact in the hall is by filling this out. What I mean by that is in the old world, you, you, you would make eye contact with somebody and that's how you would show through body language that you were interested in talking with them. You can't do that here uh, in the virtual space. So you have to be intentional about telling people if you want to network, that you tell, that you tell uh, them that you show up and that you do that through your business card. You can reach out to people here uh, throughout the day through instant messaging. You can even see in the top right there, you can video message folks. Doesn't mean they want to take your call. They may be in, you know, watching a show or a session that they don't want to leave. Uh, but we've tried to build in these opportunities. We've built in opportunities for sponsored sessions where sponsors like 3M and Anthem, both of which have uh, sessions after our afternoon keynote where you can sit down with them. You can go into their booths throughout the day for conversations. Uh, and so we're trying to use the tools of this modern age, uh, this virtual COVID pandemic age, 
uh, to meet the needs of community and of networking and of information sharing. To do this, we have to have four, four unique cohorts, uh, people who are engaged or organizations who are engaged with this. And of course, that starts with our sponsors. Uh, and Anthem it has been one of our best partners across a, a number of markets uh, and have, has been with us here in California, particularly through the pandemic and, and making sure that we continue to convene thoughtful conversations here in California. And we're just super honored to have them as one of our event sponsors. Blue Shield uh, of California Promise Health Plan has been another great sponsor who has been um, putting wind in our sails since uh, day one. And we're just super excited to have them. Of course, we're gonna hear from one of their senior executives here this morning. And uh, again, through the pandemic, when it was not always clear how things were gonna play out, uh, Blue Shield of California Promise Health Plan was uh, with us and said, we'll, we got you, don't worry, keep going, which we appreciate. We have other major sponsors, Aetna, 3M, are really best in class in a lot of ways and have been just a, a joy to work with, uh, particularly Vern and, uh, uh, and David Weatherhelt, uh, 3M, Vern, Brizendine, and Aetna, of course. And then uh, HMA and HealthNet, we did a great show with HealthNet here, a virtual conversation here recently, and HMA is uh, just you know, one of the smartest groups of people on public, uh, public lines of business you're gonna run into anywhere in the country, and including California. Sutter Health, big, you know, big name in Northern California, and we're very honored that they are engaged with us here. Uh, likewise, Sellers Dorsey, one of the uh, 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 great consultants, uh, consultancies in the United States on healthcare. So when you add in California Medical Association and all of these different organizations, uh, it's a really good group that we're proud to stand with, and we appreciate you guys. Second of our four cohorts is our convening panel. This is a group of folks who help us build the topical agenda. They help us uh, come up with speakers. They help us get ourselves organized and, and uh, uh, get us ready for today. And those folks are uh, fabulous. You can see them at our, our uh, website, of course, as well. Speakers, if you're gonna have an, a, a stakeholder-driven conversation, you gotta have stakeholders show up and all these folks come and contribute their time and, and lean into this and we're super honored to have them. And uh, last night we had 293 registrants. I understand this morning we're already over 300, so they keep coming in, I appreciate that. Uh, the fourth cohort is, of course, uh, folks have to show up if you're gonna throw a party. Uh, so I appreciate you guys doing that. Now, without further ado, thanks for sitting through all that with me, a little bit of business, a little bit of context. I wanna jump right into our morning conversation with assembly member Jim Wood, who uh, has been leading the Assembly Committee on Health uh, for a number of years now and has, has, has sort of gradually become one of the, uh, he was wise before, but now he's been around a long time. He's been, uh, he's sort of one of the uh, legislature's wise old men these days, particularly on healthcare, but on all things, I think. So assembly member, thank you very much for making time to be with us. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. So let me just start. Uh, tell us about your district, the geography, the demography, the people that you represent. Wow, my district is, a, is, is, a, is an interesting district. Uh, I represent the largest district of any Democrat in the assembly. It's about 320 miles from one end to the other. I represent five counties or four and a half actually. Uh, the largest population center is the city of Santa Rosa and I only represent half of that. And then after that, the biggest population center is 27,000. So it's a very, it's predominantly a rural district uh, with, with a single population center. I tell people it's kind of like uh, five children from different mothers. And uh, because the politics really is a microcosm of what you see across the state. I have uh, very conservative, uh, far north, I have libertarian, uh, and I have very progressive and, and a whole lot of people in the middle. So it's a, it's a challenging district to represent and uh, it's bigger than some states. Um, and uh, well, think about that. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's a challenge to get around because you can't just fly unless you have a private plane. And I don't. Yeah. Uh, you're in good company, I think. I don't have one either. Um, tell us about uh, what it's like to just try to be a health policy legislator during a time of a pandemic and what uh, this last 14 months or so has been like. It's been really challenging. Challenging. I think last year was uh, incredibly challenging for us initially because we all kind of went into the original uh, lockdown, so to speak, uh, uh, thinking that this was just going to be a couple of weeks. And obviously that stretched into a much stronger, a longer period of time. And, and my committee, uh, health committee, we typically get more bills uh, than any committee in the legislature except for appropriations. So anything that costs money has to go through appropriations. So that's the biggest one. But um, we had uh, about 150 bills last year. And we, uh, we only had ended up having one hearing. 
uh, and we had uh, we only ended up carrying about 36 bills. And so there's a lot of pent up uh, demand and frustration around uh, healthcare policy that didn't get uh, didn't get um, heard last year. Fast forward to this year, um, we had 165 bills of uh, which we are hearing about 125, um, which is difficult. And, you know, it's difficult because the, um, the uh, everything is, is, is remote, uh, people are calling in, everything takes a lot longer. Um, and the hard part for me is that the, the lack of engagement that we have, that personal lack of engagement. I don't run into my colleagues in the hallway. Um, people who are advocating on issues don't get to interact with us in the same way. Um, and that's, that puts them at a disadvantage, but I think it puts me at a, at a, big, at a big disadvantage as well. And then um, my colleagues, um, God bless them, uh, uh, do find ways uh, on difficult issues to, I didn't get your text. I didn't get your call. I didn't get your email. And so um, I'm known for just walking into people's offices and sitting down and saying, I'd really like to talk to the member, please, and haven't been able to do that. So it's made for a really challenging environment to, to, uh, to work. How would you categorize uh, how the pandemic, you, you just spoke to how it has logistically impacted or administratively impacted it. And um, has it, has it, uh, mitigated some of the verve towards more aggressive health reform measures? Or do you feel like, like, are, do you feel like your members and some advocates have said, Hey, let's just be a little more incremental because of this pandemic, or has that kind of led to a built up kind of uh, ambition and aspiration that people are like, Hey, this is exactly why we need to go big right now. How, how does that play out? Uh, I think you, you, the latter there. I think that um, when we see the, the challenges that we've had at a state level trying to manage the pandemic, from our data systems, from communication, from, from how, uh, how we roll out um, testing and, um, and, and um, how we roll out the vaccine. And you know, we've got a partner here that was, has been integral in, in both of those. And, and I'm really thankful for uh, the, the efforts of Blue Shield, quite frankly. Um, but it, uh, it, it is, it has, has been frustrating and, and what it has done, I think some of the challenges we faced in communications and, and, and data systems has led people to say, this is precisely why we need single payer health. And so that was introduced, um, and, uh, um, create, you know, it create, creates, creates a buzz in, in this building. And, uh, um, but I think what you're seeing there is, um, is a frustration that the system as we see it today isn't working well for everybody. And the reaction is, let's try something different. And um, that's different. That's yeah. about as far from our current system as you can get. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's the chatter in, 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 on, in the background. Give us a, a window into caucus politics insofar as because of your, your life outside of, of your elected uh, position and of course your position in uh, the legislature, people come to you, they look to you for guidance on legislation. You, your, your voice carries a lot of weight. How do you kind of bring along new legislators who are trying to learn the ropes uh, when it's kind of a challenge as you've already spoken to? Uh, and how do you kind of try to build consensus around bills that might be meant to be a little more contentious? Well, um, you know, my background, I'm a, I'm a dentist. Uh, I practiced for almost 30 years. And um, what I learned in, in the practice of dentistry that I never expected that would be of value here in the building was that ability to establish individual relationships with people. And you do that, you know, one person at a time, you know, talking to them, learning about what's important to them, and uh, over time, building trust. And um, I think, number one, you always have to be honest with your colleagues. And the minute you're not honest with them, um, that's the kiss of death in politics in, in, in the building here. And so I'm always, I'm always straightforward. I'm always honest. And I think I have a reputation as being a serious policy wonk. And uh, oftentimes because of my background, uh, because of my experience uh, and because of the, the relationship I've built, I get the benefit of the doubt. And that carries uh, me to the next, uh, the next piece of the puzzle and the next, the next, uh, next committee or whatever it is. And so, but it's all about those personal relationships and it takes time and it takes trust and it's an ongoing process. Yeah. I wanna make sure that uh, I remind our attendees 
that of course you can pose a question in the chat box here just on the, the right of your screen. And as you uh, prioritize those, you can sort of click this little thumbs up icon and, and uh, I'll read those into our conversations so that you can ask questions here today. I wanna remind you also that uh, uh, you, should, you can do that throughout the day and that questions beget questions. So the more you post in the box, the more others will post. And as a consequence, the better the overall conversation will be. Uh, Assembly member, give me a, some sense of what it's like um, working with this administration versus the previous administration in terms of, uh, you know, getting answers and collaborating with the DHCS and, and the, the uh, agency overall. Uh, how would you compare this administration to the last one? Well, um, different. Um, you know, I came in uh, in this when the second term of uh, actually the fourth term of Jerry Brown, but the second term, as I knew, as we knew it in, in recent years, um, to an administration that was really in many ways clicking on all cylinders and um, and uh, a very different style, uh, a very different style. Uh, and then you fast forward to a new new administration, a different a different approach. Um, and, you know, change is not easy for us. Um, you get used to something and, and you kind of like it. I mean, I think that's just kind of a normal thing. Um, and, and I think we were getting to a point uh, before the pandemic that, okay, I, I've got them figured out. We, we, know who, we know who we need to talk to. We know, we know how this administration works. And then the pandemic hit and it all just hit the fan, quite frankly, you know communications kind of broke down. And it, you know, I, I'm not going to point fingers. I mean, it broke down everywhere. It broke down with us. It broke down, you know, you name it. And, um, and so over time, you know, that goes back to those, that relationship building, I've rebuilt and, 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 and strengthened the relationships I have with Secretary of Health and Human Services, the Secretary of Department of Public Health, um, and the governor. And I was with the governor yesterday um, in my county. I'm not, I'm not all just about healthcare. We have a drought. And so um, I got a couple of minutes to talk healthcare with the governor, and um, that means a lot. And uh, that he knows we know each other, we know our passions, and um, and uh, you know I, I'm very fortunate to uh, have been able to build a good relationship with this governor. You want to share what you said to him? Ah, <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> Just fine. Just fine. It doesn't hurt for me to ask. Uh, Sue Wakamoto Lee asks a question. Uh, she said, I heard yesterday, yesterday that AB 1400 will not proceed out of the rules committee to your committee. Is that correct? Yes, it is. I, I got a, well, I was, I was out of cell range for a big part of the day yesterday. That's the nature of my district, but, uh, and getting there sometimes, but uh, I got a literally about a 15 second phone call from the speaker and said, I'm just telling you that AB 1400 is going to be a two year bill. And I just said, uh, can we talk? And he said, not right now. And that was the end of the conversation. So have not spoken to the author. Don't, uh, don't know. I know that there had been conversations going on for several days about the bill and um, don't know, uh, don't know how it ended up here, but I'll make it really clear. I did not hold the bill. I didn't ask for the bill to be held. Um, uh, and had the bill come to me, I would have heard the bill. Um, that being said, um, I think the the financing part of this and 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 everything else uh, was woefully weak, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, and you know, I, I had many conversations with the author, and um, and I was hoping for uh, some changes. But at the end of the day, um, from introduction to yesterday, we really didn't see anything change. And uh, I, I don't know what happened, but it's obvious that the bill's not going to move this year. And he made a statement that that um, he, he'll be trying to move it in the in the in, in the following year. Can you uh, tell some of the uh, of our folks what AB fourteen hundred is? Those that might not be in the building every day. Yeah, AB fourteen hundred uh, would uh, be a bill that would establish that uh, California would uh, pursue a single payer health plan. Um, the, uh, it was a, 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 a bill that talked about all the benefits that would happen, um, uh, including, um, you know, long-term care and dentistry and podiatry and, and everything. Uh, it would have been the most robust health care uh, program in the entire world, quite frankly. Um, it had a governing board that um, didn't include anybody who had any financial expertise, uh, didn't include any any policy experts. Um, didn't really 
uh, beyond that governing board didn't lay out a leadership structure in any way. And more importantly to me is it didn't lay out how we were going to pay for it. And um, I've been criticized by people for asking that question, but in my world, you don't get to propose big legislation without at least taking a stab at how you're going to pay for it. And uh, we still don't know what the total cost would be. We're expecting a report from the California Health Benefit Review Program at UC Berkeley, who, uh, who examines uh, programs or, or bills for us to give us what the dollar amount is from their perspective, unbiased, objective, um, UC-based uh, program, and we're waiting for that. Um, and the reality is um, we will have a much uh, deeper understanding of that in the months to come because the, they wanted six months uh, to do that analysis and they got two. So we're getting kind of what I call the quick and dirty version of it, um, but we're hoping that we actually get this fleshed out. So we understand, um, you know, and uh, um, look, I have spent my entire career whether I'm practicing dentistry or here in the building, trying to improve access, improve quality, and get as many people covered by healthcare as possible. So I get painted as an obstructionist, but I just say I'm pragmatic and uh, looking for things that we can deliver on. And uh, that, to me, a lot of it means incremental progress. And uh, that's not what um, some people want. I think uh, pragmatism is needed and uh, it's an important part of politics. Uh, Patrick Pine, who runs the uh, RFK Health Plan, uh, uh, a plan for farm workers in California, asked this question. Uh, we have a panel later today discussing issues related to concerns over health consolidation, healthcare organizations consolidating uh, due to mergers and acquisitions and related to antitrust concerns. That seems to be a big issue both at the federal and state level. Do you see any attention to that in this year's session? Well, we had, uh, I introduced a, a series of bills this year. Um, first, uh, time I've ever done this, three bills in, in sequence, AB 1130 to establish an Office of Healthcare Affordability, uh, uh, AB 1131 to uh, establish a statewide health information exchange, and, and H AB 1132 to, um, to look at consolidation. And uh, consolidation was a big topic last year, uh, and uh, that bill did not get across the line. Uh, and um, we have set aside 1132 this year. I have every intention of picking that up next year. Um, but we know uh, from what we've seen, the consolidation, and we've had hearings on this, so that I'm not just pulling this out of, out of the air. Consolidation in general leads to higher prices for consumers. And, um, and so what, what I wanna see is if there's consolidation out there, that the consumer is the one that benefits uh, uh, more than uh, the consolidating entities, and uh, um, that we that we also find a way to make sure that we this consolidation leads to increased access, increased quality, uh, and those are the things that are important to me. Assemblymember Jim Wood, the chair of the Assembly Health Committee on Health, thank you, sir, for making time to be with us. I appreciate it. Thank you, my pleasure. Very good. We're going to turn now to uh, Kimberly Good, who is the Senior Vice President for External Affairs at Blue Shield of California. Kimberly, thanks for making time to be with us. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I look forward to the discussion. Yeah. So uh, December 13th, I remember trucks rolling out of the Michigan Pfizer plant and vaccines were on the way. And uh, in February, uh, Blue Shield was selected as the, uh, as the TPA, essentially, for the state of California to deliver a whole wide range of uh, or manage all the logistics or a lot of the logistics of, of uh, the vaccine distribution. Um, give us a sense of what that has been like over the last few months and, and some of what you've learned as a result. Well, first of all, I, I would say that um, for us at Blue Shield of California, getting involved and being asked to support the vaccine um, administration was really an extension of our, our mission and our commitment to the health and well-being of all Californians. Um, while this has been you know, a really big undertaking, this isn't our first um, effort to be supportive of the state as it relates to a COVID-19 response. It started way back you know, last year when the pandemic first hit. And you know, we found a way to support you know, our people, our employees, the providers, and the community through that. Uh, we also had a stint at co-chairing the testing task force where we had a lot of good success there. So this um, effort to help accelerate vaccinations was really an extension of our strong commitment to helping Californians recover. 
Um, how's it been? Wow, it's been um, a pretty um, intense undertaking. Um, we got on board and, and in the early days, it was a seven day a week exercise um, to really lock arms with every local health jurisdiction and all of the agencies across the state to figure out how we could save more lives. At the end of the day, the goal of the project, and that's how we were approached, help us save more lives. And um, you know, certainly we feel really good about where we are as a state, but we also know that we're not done yet. And so you know, the work continues. So give us a sense of scope, uh, you know, shots and arms, people mobilized to support this effort. How, how big in, in some, some terms of numbers or quantitatively can you uh, share? How big was this effort in California? So let's start with kind of where we are. And you heard the governor say that we have the lowest COVID-19 rate in the nation. We should celebrate that. We've had 26 million vaccinations administered. That's awesome. That is uh, nearly 10 million more than any other state. And if we were to quantify that compared to countries around the world, it put us at like number six. That's pretty amazing. So from a Blue Shield third party administrator perspective, our job was really to come in and build off of what was in place to extend the network so that we would have more providers in every area of the state so that we could accelerate vaccination. You know, when we first um, accepted the assignment, there was some concern that, you know, Blue Shield was going to take away or disrupt what was already in place. And we never saw this as an assignment of subtraction. It was for us addition. And so at the end of the day, you know, we now have, um, you know, more than 3,000 providers in the network. Um, we are covering 99% of the state um, in terms of uh, where we have locations. Uh, and we have a capacity to administer, you know, up to 6 million shots a week. Now we're not doing that many because we don't have the supply, but the goal was to create a robust network so that as the supply increases, we will be ready to, to vaccinate Californians in every part of the state uh, as quickly as we possibly can. How, what did you, how did you think about the question of equity? Uh, how did you think about racial equity, economic equity, geographic equity? Uh, and what have you learned as a result of doing this over the last two or three months uh, that might've been different from what you anticipated going into it? Well, one of the, I think, greatest learnings um, from an equity perspective is when we started this, the state already had established a five-point plan for equity. And in that plan, there was real intentionality around embedding equity into our thinking for everything that we do whether it was in allocation, network, data analytics, um, community partnerships, and in uh, education, public communication and education. So as a third party administrator, you know, we locked arms with that five point equity strategy. And one of the key outcomes of this is that we don't just, there's not a pocket of people that are thinking about equity. Every single participant is, is focused on equity. Every provider in the network, we consider an equity provider. We don't relegate uh, the, the job of ensuring the most vulnerable are vaccinated only to those that serve Medi-Cal members or only those that are located in, in certain zip codes. We wanna make sure that everyone, every provider, every decision that's made in the process is focused on equity. So what we've seen as a result, um, and we have quite, you know, concretely, you know, increased the amount of vaccine going to those communities, going to those areas where we know the disease burden is higher. So we are using the Healthy Places Index, the first quartile, as a way of understanding where the disease burden is higher, we need to meet that with an increased amount of vaccination. And that's how we've approached that. And that's helping us to close the gap. Um, we know that we're not where we need to be, but we are seeing more and more folks um, vaccinated in that first quartile. And uh, that's helping to close the gap. From a race and ethnicity perspective, um, there's still opportunity there. And we're still trying to get uh, all of the, the data to understand how we're doing. We know that, um, that there's more opportunity and we're focusing on that with lots of interventions to ensure that we do create equity um, from that perspective as well. How, how have you as a, as a senior leader in a health plan, which is usually um, 
you know, usually health plans have a, a lot of white dudes around the boardroom and the executive uh, table. And how has your lived experience as an African American, uh, as you know, as firstly a senior leader, but also who is African American, how has that informed uh, your approach in, in thinking through this work and making sure that nobody's left behind because of uh, their demographics? Well, I think there's two things that I'd highlight. Number one, I'm really fortunate, and this is not a commercial, this is just a fact, to be in an environment at Blue Shield where I am not the only person that looks like me in the room. Um, we have a woman, um, we have board parity between genders. We have ethnic diversity on our board of directors. Our senior team is ethnically diverse. So that's number one in that my lived experience certainly informs the perspective I bring, but I also am surrounded by a really diverse set of executives who also, you know, champion this. I also think it's, you know, I, I have really enjoyed working alongside Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, another African American woman um, who's very focused on health equity, and then Secretary Alonda Richardson, um, who is also African American. So we, the three of us, get to uh, spend a lot of energy um, championing and and partnering on driving health equity, uh, but we're not the only ones for sure. So it informs, you know, my experience is informed as a mother, you know, as a person of color. Um, as, as one who um, appreciates the different experiences that we all have and certainly the, the inequity that has existed. And that certainly helped me to bring voice to the fact that we, we need to go and meet people where they are. We need to tap into trusted advisors and trusted uh, members of the community. Um, and one of the biggest challenges, of course, is overcoming the the vaccine hesitancy that sometimes uh, causes people to, to be wary. When, you know, you opened your remarks talking about the erosion of trust. Well, certainly the lack of trust for some communities in the healthcare system is real. And so we've got to, to work really hard at restoring that trust and, and not letting trust get in the way of what needs to happen to come through this pandemic. So we're very focused on that. How did your thinking about the addressing vaccine hesitancy, uh, how did that change and get informed by your work? How has some of the messaging changed? How has some of the outreach, how have those outreach strategies changed? Um, give us some insight in terms of the effort to address vaccine hesitancy across communities. So the first thing I'd say is the vaccine hesitancy work is largely led by the state. So that was in place before Blue Shield signed up as TPA and we partner with them. Um, the good news is we use data and data is really important. You heard Assemblyman member Jim Wood talk about the importance of data. Um, we've used data to help inform where we're making progress and reducing hesitancy. And we're also using that data to see unexpected things. For example, you know, we talked a lot in the early days about um, vaccine hesitancy among communities of color what we now are seeing and understanding is there's vaccine hesitancies in uh, rural counties, and that will require different uh, types of intervention to address. So, you know, we're using the data to understand where are there opportunities or gaps, and then we're also using it to determine what are the best interventions. Is it where vaccinations occur because they're more trusted providers that people are, are uh, open to? Is it showcasing more examples of people like me or people like you who get the vaccine that creates greater confidence? So we're using that data to both inform how we message, but also how we implement in ways that will overcome that hesitancy and, and get folks um, with vaccinations in their arms. So, you know, one of the reasons I uh, like talking to folks at Blue Shield is you guys have, uh, you look across the state, you look across different lines of business and, and you guys have a lot of data. There are other plans that do that too, but uh, how do you think when you incorporate all of that data that you're speaking of and all of the experience of this pandemic, how do you think this will change our healthcare system moving forward? How will it change how Blue Shield uh, works moving forward two, three years ago, or two, three years from now? Well, I think one hopeful outcome of this is that we've all learned how to work more quickly. Um, at the end of the day, our company is an example, and I'm sure many others, 
really moved to a remote workforce like instantaneously. We realized that it was in everyone's best interest to, to, to be at work remote and be, and be safe. Um, so I think the speed of being able to respond, we hope that's something that we can replicate going forward. I hope that the equity focus is something that we can replicate going for, forward. Um, conversations need to be um, deeper and more complete around all of the inequity in, uh, in health outcomes. And I'm hopeful that that's a takeaway that we can, can uh, focus on as well. The other thing I'd say is what COVID-19 has helped us see is that all of the things that impacted health and well-being before the pandemic really became more exacerbated as the pandemic unfolded. So all of us know that health and well-being is impacted by more than just what happens in the doctor's office or in hospitals. It's all these other factors, education, um, employment, access to food, the criminal justice system, racism, all of those factors impact health and well-being. And we've had to address those as a TPA in terms of how we ensure we have the vaccination providers in the right locations, how we have the right hours, how we have the right trusted advisors. We've had to address many of those things, accommodating different work schedules, um, accommodating um, employment sectors that needed to serve. So my, my message there is that as we think about you know, health reform for health care and health policy, it has to be broader than just what happens in the doctor's office or in the, the health care system. We need to really have integrated public-private partnerships to address all the complex issues that ultimately impact health and well-being. So let me flip some of this on its head. How do you, what is it that you have heard from doing this, this work uh, in communities across the state of California, what have you heard that you think the rest of the healthcare sector would be better off for having known? What can the communities tell healthcare about this experience? Well, one thing we've learned and was affirmed for us is that listening matters. You know, for Blue Shield of California, as we approached our third party administrator role, we met with every local health jurisdiction individually because we wanted to understand and we wanted to build upon what was working in each of those jurisdictions. So we didn't come in with our own belief on what was gonna work. So listening matters and you gotta to go to where people are and you have to understand what's important to them and co-create solutions. So that's a, a, a takeaway and certainly something that we have heard um, from the community. And I think you know the community is also telling us that um, we're not done. There's a lot more work to be done to achieve equity. Um, and it's, it's in so many different aspects. It's making healthcare providers more diverse, making them more culturally competent. There's lots of opportunity for us to, to build on the learnings coming out of uh, COVID-19 to make the healthcare system um, more equitable uh, and to better meet the, the needs of all Californians. Very good. Kimberly Good, the Senior Vice President for External Affairs at Blue Shield of California. Kimberly, thanks for making time to be with us. Thank you. 20, let me just ask, 26 million shots, is that what you said? You I guys, did. I hope I got it right, but that's what I said. <laughs> that's a good number. Very impressive. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you. Thank you.